Hey, everybody out there, uh, wherever you are, thanks for tuning in. I hope you're doing good. Uh, I am Michael Thurber, um, composer, songwriter, performer, uh, musician, dude, and very proud member of the MTC family. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working on many shows at MTC and writing a lot of music. Uh, so I'm super psyched to be hanging out with you guys today. This is going to be uh, an awesome hour or 45 minutes uh, or whatever it is, we get kicked off after an hour, so it's not going to be any more than an hour. Uh, I get to talk to one of my favorite people in the world, uh, which is just such a pleasure and such a joy. Uh, this gentleman that I'm going to be uh, conversing with is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, he's an incredible director. Um, he is an incredible um, sort of theater visionary. He's, he's one of the best directors you could ever hope to work with as a writer, uh, in particular, uh, and he's just a joy to be around. He's had an incredibly uh, singular journey uh, up until this point through his career in theater. Um, so it's, it's, it's really going to be a great conversation. Uh, and this man that I'm talking about um, is Sahim Ali. You've probably seen one of his shows. He's directed so many shows around New York City, uh, so many different theaters off Broadway. At MTC specifically, um, in addition to directing many readings, uh, he directed uh, Danye Our Love's Sugar in Our Wounds in 2018, uh, which I had the pleasure of writing the music for. Uh, and then he also directed Jeff Augustine's uh, The New Englanders just last fall in October, also at MTC, which I also wrote the music for. Uh, so Sahim and I have worked together on many projects. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's going to be a very wide ranging conversation just to give you a feel of what you're in for. Um, I thought we would start with Sahim's journey um, to the point that he's at in his career now. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been a very singular journey. Uh, he's a remarkable guy. Uh, and so I'd love to just hear a little bit more about his life story uh, and how he came into directing, um, what's inspiring him, uh, what he's looking forward to in the current landscape that we're in right now with theater uh, and all the unknowns. Um, and then after that, we'll just sort of see where the conversation goes. Uh, he and I have a lot to talk about. Again, we've worked on so many shows together. Uh, I know from MTC and from a few other folks that knew we were doing this, there's some interest in hearing us talk about musical theater, uh, as well as the difference between musical theater and incidental music and how that functions and plays and how those collaborations work. So it's going to be tons of amazing stuff. Um, so fasten your seatbelts. Uh, because we're going to go ahead and invite Sahim Ali to join our conversation. So, Sahim, if you are out there, go ahead and yes. I'm gonna... Right now, let's see if this works. It says it's waiting for him. Oh, also, uh, for those of you just tuning in, if you have any questions, we'll get to all of them at the end. So send us all your questions in the comments. We'll be checking in, but just to keep the flow going, We'll get to the Q&A at the end. Saheem. Hey, Mike. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. This is so beautiful. What a privilege. What a joy. Hey. I feel like we always have a lot to talk about, but to, to have the privilege of doing it on MTC's page is awesome. I know. Oh, Roderick, I love you too. And Michael Roderick. Love you too. <laughs> oh, that's Roderick Covens and we love Roderick. Yeah. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm good. You know, that's, that's, that, that, it's the question of the moment, right? I'm good. I'm hanging in there. I'm taking it day by day, you know, trying to stay engaged. Um, like most people at home, like most people not working um, actively, but I am very fortunate. Um, I'm part of the SDC, my director's union. I'm on the board of that. And so I have through that been very blessed to be engaged with the questions surrounding our industry in particular in the theater. Um, what are we doing? What can we do? What should we be doing? Um, and there's a lot of questions to grapple with. So I'm on a bunch of committees that are just like dealing with that because creativity has shifted now. Um, and we're just trying to figure out how to survive, how to stay sane, how to stay healthy and how to be creative, even with the limitations that we have right now. So I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Heard, heard. That is your How are you? Man. That's a lot. That's a lot. How are thank you? you. I, I am good. I am good. But thank you for, for doing all of that. It's really important to have people like you that are involved on the administrative level and are trying to figure out how we're going to come back from this and what we're going to do. And I know that's no small feat. So thank you for doing that. 
Uh, I am great. I am in the exact same boat. Uh, I'm safe and sound. I'm very fortunate for that. It's, it's, it's very different, right? Because you, oh, we got comments about the beards. I know, I saw yep. <laughs> Just two bearded gentlemen, nothing to say here, folks. No big deal. Love you, Amber. <laughs> Love you, Amber. Uh, no, I, I'm doing very well, though, too. And I'm glad to be doing so. And, and just like you mentioned, trying to figure out what the next steps are um, and where we go from here. And it's very interesting, right? Because now we're all in this completely unknown situation. Um, and I bet that this is not what you were thinking a career in theater would be when you left home in Kenya, uh, however many years ago that you did. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> also did you like that segue i did you know i i, very I stayed nice, up all night very nice that. that's right, that's right. <laughs> i do what i can i do what i can <laughs> uh no uh -huh. but, but i i really would love to just jump in because i know i know you're probably like me everybody that i talk to i leave about the first 15 minutes of the conversation just to talk about what's going on right now because you kind of have yeah. to uh but i'm sure so many people are seeing a lot of that and so i kind of wanted to just jump right in because as interesting as our unknown future is you my friend are one of the most interesting people that is out there uh certainly that i know and you've had an amazing journey so i mean most people that are on this chat right now have seen one of your productions no doubt because you've directed so much the last few years in new york uh and regionally for that matter um, but they might not all know um, your story, which I find really inspiring um, and, and just very singular. So you are from Kenya. Let's start there. Where, where in Kenya? Where, 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 did you, where did you first hear about theater? How did you start to get interested in it? Yeah, so I'm from Nairobi, born and raised in East Africa. Uh, my parents grew up in Tanzania, which is south of Kenya. Um, and so I grew up in Nairobi. Um, and I, we didn't, I didn't have much theater growing up. Um, I loved film and television, obviously. And the theater experience in Kenya, when I was growing up, I don't know so much now, was really limited to um, like traditional kind of like oral histories. Um, we didn't have much in terms of like a play that I could go and see. Uh, that culture and that kind of tradition just didn't exist. And so um, I grew up kind of artistically inclined. I would like put on like shows in my neighborhood, like convince kids to like, you know, um, spend some time with me and put on a show and invite our parents and charge them money, like all kinds of like crazy shit. You were um, savvy all the way back then. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, you know, perform poetry. I used to do a lot of like poetry performance when I was a kid, because that was like a, a means of artistic expression in Nairobi, um, in Swahili and, and in English and sometimes in French. Um, and it wasn't until, so I was really fortunate, my dad was an airline pilot, and it wasn't until I was 15, I went on a trip to him to London, and um, I got to see a musical for the first time. I saw Grease in London, and that was the first time I'd ever seen, like, a spectacle on stage, that play, and it, like, just blew my mind. Um, and as you know, um, I just came back to Kenya, and I was just so obsessed with this thing that I had seen on stage in London that I had never experienced before. So. I, I developed this obsession with like putting on a musical. So I had the cassette that I bought at the theater and I wrote a script from like my memory of the production that I saw. And, and I got a group of my friends together and I said, we're going to do this show. We're going to do this show called Grease that I saw in London. It's amazing. And like, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you where to go. I'm going to be in it. I'm going to play this guy called Danny Zuko. He's really cool. So I need to play. Uh, <laughs> Wait, so you not only directed it, you acted in it as well. You I were the star. I acted in it. I choreographed it. I designed it. I, you know, I was like a one man shot. Um, and it was, you know, no one told me what to do because there was no one doing that. But I just kind of, you know, figured it out on the fly. And we couldn't sing either. So we lip synced to the cassette that I Whoa. bought at the theater. Um, Whoa. And we put on a show and that was like the first thing when I look back it's the first thing that I directed uh, and I guess I was bitten after that whoa 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 so like natural born direct that was just your instinct before you even knew what directing was yeah wow you know it's interesting too. Greece of all things like had that music made it to that part of the world at that time like what what's the influence of American music and American culture in Nairobi at that time 
pop music, pop culture. We had like a few TV shows, like we had, you know, Family Matters, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. This is when I was 15. Those are the shows that we were watching. Um, and music we were listening to, LL Cool J, Michael Jackson, like all the stuff that you were listening to on the radio in the States. So we got radio music and we got like a few TV shows. We only had two TV stations. Um, and so we were really well versed in like current, like American culture, but not musicals, not theater. Um, I didn't even know that there was a movie version of Greece when I wow. saw the thing in London. Um, I don't know so. if that's a blessing or not a good thing. <laughs> I'll leave that for the audience to decide. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But it's, and you mentioned also that some of the only theater that was going on at that, or that you were aware of earlier on in your life was sort of like traditional storytelling, you said? Is that the word that yeah, you used? Yeah. What, what did that look like? Like um, traditional dances, um, uh, like kind of like oral histories, like stories of ancestors, cultural kind of references, and a lot of skits. That's the thing I remember when I was in school. If you would watch a play, it would be a skit about like, you know, um, what you sh like not, you know, to prevent getting teenage pregnancy or to, um, you know, not to contract HIV. So it was very kind of educational and it was always a warning to it. So people would enact these scenarios of like, you know, a guy like convincing a girl to like have sex with him and then she got pregnant. And then the moral being, if a guy asks you to have sex, don't do it because you're going to get pregnant. I mean, it was very kind of morally couched. Wow. So that was the kind of theater that I was watching um, because that was, that was kind of all that there was. We didn't have plays. We didn't have, I didn't, the first time I heard Shakespeare, the first time I read like an actual script of a play was like a long time after that. Wow. So, you know, not to get too deep so early in the conversation, but I'm curious, what was it, do you think, about Greece? Um, I guess it was specifically Greece, but then theater in general, if it wasn't something that you grew because, you know, there's so many people that get into the arts that, you know, play an instrument because their parents both played professionally or they were actors and so they act now. Um, but, you know, for you to find it later in your life and you'd already been exposed to other things like popular music, the music of the region, you know, what was it about theater specifically that you think really was a light bulb? Yeah, if I look back now with like, you know, nostalgia and like perspective, I think it was an escape, you know? Um, there was just something about that form of creativity that allowed me to escape into a different world. And I think I really needed that and I really appreciated that. I mean, even, even in the world that we're in, you know, in the last like two, three, four years here in this country, like one of the things that I really appreciate about a rehearsal room is I can escape into a world. Like there's so much shit happening in the world, so much, you know, political turmoil, social turmoil, and it's all true. And I wanna be aware of what's happening and I wanna be engaged with it in some way, but I also need to get away from it all. And I just find for me, the theater room and the theater process is such a solace. It's such a, a, a bomb for my soul where I can engage in something that I feel like has, a, has creativity and artistry to it and I wanna collaborate. That's why I love the theater. I want to be in a room where I have to engage with other people. It's not just about me and my own brain. Like I can't, I feel like if you're, even if you're a musician, like you can make a piece of music in your apartment, you know? Um, if you're a writer, you can just write that script at home. But if you're a theater maker at some level, like you have to engage with other people, you know, which mm. is why this moment mm. is like so intense because we are robbed of connection. We are robbed of collaboration. We are robbed of intimacy. You know, all the things that I love about the theater, we're, we, don't, we don't have. So it's, a, it's challenging for that moment. But I think for me, it's about that escape. Wow, wow. So out of the, um, out of the different ways to escape that Greece presented? Because you had some serious avenues there. I mean, you could have gone totally, you know, uh, the, the lead male uh, pop star that you are. You could have been belting <laughs> it out and escaping that way. Or, or you could uh -huh. go into directing, or you could have decided that you wanted to be a choreographer or all the different things that you did in this situation. So what, what, which one did you decide to pursue after Greece? Because after that, I, I think it was probably within a, a few years or a year, you, you were on your way to, to America for college. Is that, is that true? Yeah, I did. Uh, someone saw me. So there was a semi-professional theater company in, uh, in Nairobi that I just had never gone to. I think it was mostly like white expatriates and like, um, you know, white descendants of colonialists who went to see the theater there because it was Shakespeare and Ibsen and the kind of thing that I had no context for. So someone from that theater saw me in Greece and, and invited me to 
be to play this role called Mercutio in this play called Romeo and Juliet that I knew nothing about. Um, so that was the first time I was cast in a play was to play that role. And then all of a sudden, this whole other world was opened up to me. So then I learned like there is like a theater industry. You can go to school for that. You can study that. You can be part of um, that kind of uh, uh, that kind of um, study. So I came to the U.S. after that, and I wanted to study theater. My parents wouldn't let me, so I pretended to be a computer science major, and then I switched my major, and then I didn't tell them. Um, and so I see I the I see here. the twinkle in the eye. It was there all the way back then. Huh? <laughs> I moved here under the guise of being a computer scientist, and really, I just I wanted to study theater. But um, yeah, so I moved here to do that. Wow! 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 So it started off with acting. Uh, primarily? It was acting, yeah, because I I didn't understand, like, I put on Greece, but I really didn't understand, you know, what I was doing or that there could be, like, a profession in that. When you see acting, you're like, oh, I could do that. But when you when it's directing, it's, it's just more, so much more nebulous. So it wasn't until I moved here and I went to, uh, to college, to undergrad in Boston, that I started to learn, like, there's a director, there's a lighting designer, there's a dramaturg, like, all the different things. And it was in the trial and error of that that I, <laughs> Roderick. <laughs> what is he saying? <laughs> Roderick. Roderick uh, is the most loving, wonderful troll you could ask for <laughs> on an Instagram live. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I love you, Roderick. So it wasn't until, um, un until then, and I got to try my hands in both. I was like, you know what? I think I enjoy directing more than acting. Um, because I, I, I remember being in this play and having like a, a, a bad director, just someone who I, I, for me, he didn't get it. And I was like, it was torture. It was torture to be an actor with like a director who I didn't think was, had the, just like the eye on the big picture. And then when I tried directing and I had like a challenge of an actor who wasn't quite like, you know, uh, uh, getting it or I needed to coach them or something, I was like, oh, I can do that. Like I'm enjoying doing that. So I enjoyed being in one side where the pro where, you know of the problem, then the other side of the problem. I was like, yes. okay, I think I'm a director. The lesser of two evils. Theory. Yes, that's that's <laughs> always the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So then that once now that was not an undergrad though, because there's not a there was not a directing undergrad major. Or there wasn't there a was. major, but um, my professor allowed me to direct. So you you could propose. To, there wasn't a directing major, but I. I asked if I could direct. And so I directed I like small, small like, shows. I see, I see. And so yeah. then it was later though that you got um, fully invested in, in directing. Did you, between undergrad and the rest of your education, did you go back to Kenya or did you stay in the States? Or what was the journey once you started to realize like, I wanna direct, what did, you, what did you think the next best step was? Yeah, I had to figure out two things. One, how to stay in this country because I was, um, um, uh, what school was this? I was in an undergrad in Boston Northeastern University. Um, uh, and then I applied for graduate school. So I was like, okay, so the next level is, is graduate school, obviously, because I needed to stay in academia in order to stay in this country. Um, wow. So then I applied to different grad schools and then I moved to New York to go to Columbia for directing. So that's when I really kind of narrowed my focus and moved to New York for that and, and stayed as a result. You know, I like this idea of narrowing, if you don't mind staying on that for a second, because I feel like that's how a lot of our journeys go. We start, you know, as like a blank slate and then things start to happen to us and we start to make choices and it gets more and more narrowed down. And so now you are a director, you're in New York City, you're at Columbia. What was the next step? Because like you mentioned a minute ago, like, your access to like even understanding that acting was a viable career or that theater was a viable career was through this sort of like Eurocentric Shakespeare and stuff. Uh, I, I relate to that. That was my journey with classical music as well. I never played classical music, but that was the only thing that was presented to me as a way to go to school and then have a career. Uh -huh. So I hear you on that. But then how did you start to make choices after you, you, you went down the path, you know, and now you're a director, but what did you start to decide you liked to direct? What, you know, as opposed to, were, were you all about musicals still? Were you interested in plays? What types of stories? Yeah, at that, I, I talk about narrowing. So it's like, yeah, you know, you reach different points where you narrow different things. So um, I narrowed down on where I wanted to live. I wanted to live in the US. I did not want to go back to Kenya because I just realized that 
I loved this country. I loved being here. I loved the people I was meeting. And I just had the opportunity to be an artist here in a way that I couldn't be in Kenya. So I narrowed down on where I was going to live. Okay, then I'm going to do the arts. And then I narrowed down on directing because I, I enjoyed it more. I felt like I had more of a handle on like the big picture. Um, I was just more comfortable directing um, ultimately than I was acting. So I narrowed down. And then in terms of directing, you know, my, the, the shift that happened for me in terms of narrowing was that I felt at first that to be a good director, you have to direct anything. Like someone puts a script in your hand and you'd be like, okay, I can do that, you know? And I thought that is the measure of a good director, just like you need to be as versatile and, and dexterous and, you know, able. Um, so I came out of undergrad being like, yeah, I want to direct everything and anything. And like, that's the mark of a good director. And gradually what I realized after grad school actually and being out in the world that was actually about finding the stories that I was drawn to, um, the, the stories that meant something to me and really truly the energy that I wanted to put out into the world. I feel like as human beings and especially as artists, we have a choice of what energies to engage with. We have a choice of what stories we want to tell, or what rooms we want to be in, who we want our collaborators to be, what material we care about. And so I realized that it's not about being able to direct anything, but it's actually about articulating the type of theater that you want to be engaged with and the types of stories and the types of collaborators. And once you find the language mm. for that, because the first part is in thinking about it, and then you've got to articulate it. You've got to find the language for it. And you can only find the language for something if you've given it some thought and consideration. Um, and then once you articulate it, you put that articulation out into the world. Wow. That's something that I really believe in. It's like, that's you name Oprah. it. That's Oprah. That's beautiful. And then you put it out. Because then when you do that, it comes. Wow. It wow. Comes, you know? Wow. I love this. I love this. I want to talk more about that. And I also want to talk about specifically some of the stories that you have decided to focus on, uh, it, it, including the two MTC productions you did, Sugar in Our Wounds and The New Englanders. But and you said one other, yes, we worked on both of them together. We, we have a track record, don't we? Uh, but it, I want to talk about all of that. But you said one very interesting thing a minute back, and you were talking about um, to be a great director, you felt like you had to be able to do anything. Somebody gives it to you and you can direct it. And, you know, that's, that's about having the chops, right? That's about having the, the technical facility. And, and I personally have always really wondered, what is that for a director? I would love to hear you speak to that a little bit because some jobs like my job or the job of an actor, they're, they're very hard, very sophisticated, very nuanced jobs like any job, but it's a little more clear. Like, you know, I'm the guy that goes and writes the songs and I come back and I have a song. Or as a director, you're responsible for lighting design, costume design. You're, you're essentially a CEO almost, in addition to being in the weeds of the creative process. So I, I would love to know for you on a strictly craft level, what does that mean to, to have chops as a director and to be able to direct anything? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say like at the core of it, like let's say I read a script. I read a script. I Am I interested in it? Am I engaged with it? Do I see the potential for um, like um, growth and um, uh, some kind of journey that I'm gonna go on by virtue of working on the thing. And then in terms of the chops, it's like, how can I break it down in a way that um, the process, the rehearsal process and exploration process actually um, um, helps me to get it from, from, you know, from page to stage. So you gotta, you, there are steps to build, right? So how am I going to break it down for myself? How am I going to find the best actors to, for these roles? How am I going to assemble a design team for this particular story? How am I going to um, organize a rehearsal process so that we are maximizing the potential and creativity every step of the way to lead towards the thing? What is the vision? And then what are the steps to lead towards the vision? You know, And in terms of like the, the CEO thing that you mentioned, I think it's also about recognizing what my strengths are and what my strengths are not because that is the beauty of collaboration we're going to be engaging in a way but like i'm not a lighting designer i'm not a sound designer but i have to have like a little bit of information about what those processes entail but also defer to the people who i've invited to the table to say okay you are the expert at this let me tell you what i'm seeing and you will help me bring the thing that i'm seeing to life you know, that's what actors do. That's what designers do. That's what 
Um, even a stage manager does it. Everyone is contributing to the energy of the piece that you're going to be presenting up there. So I think the craft level isn't being able to, you know, break it down so that you understand just the, the mechanics of it, but then inviting the right kind of collaborators and giving your collaborators everything they, they need to do their best work as well. Wow, wow, wow. That's super deep. And collaboration is hard. I mean, that you're essentially talking about a super high level of collaboration. I mean, that's the backbone, the foundation of your job, in a sense, from what I hear you saying. Yeah, so and what, if, I can, if I can talk a little bit about our collaboration, for as an example, you know, like you- Sure, as long music. as it's only very nice things. <laughs> as long as it's only perfect things, then you can talk about it. You know, just, yeah. just to turn this around a little bit. Um, you know, you do music, and um, you are like one of the most versatile musicians I know, just in terms of like all the different avenues, but all the different like mo modes of music that you understand and you are versed in. So you and I have worked together on musicals, on plays, um, and each project has been so different from the other one. But you understand a world that I don't, and I understand a world that you don't. So we come at it from two different angles, but ultimately we want to tell the same story, right? So yeah. I feel like it doesn't matter if it's a musical, it doesn't matter if it's a play, like we need to be on the same page about what story we're telling, why we're telling it, why we care, because then, you know, you bring your best self to it. But don't you find then that in that exchange that we have as collaborators, like there's always, that's always at the heart of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you, you hit something um, really powerful when you, you said, you know, giving thought to who you bring to the table like really thinking about who that person is. Um, I, I feel like you do a very good job at that. And I think that's maybe one of the most unsung or unspoken of parts of collaboration, right? Is 90% is of the job can get done just in trying to suss out who, these, who the people that you're thinking about are and do you see this the same? And, mm -hmm. um, and you do a really wonderful job of that. Um, I mean, I saw that firsthand to bring it to MTC uh, in both of the productions that we worked on together. Um, I came into both of those plays. We're talking about um, Sugar in Our Wounds by Danye Our Love, which was in the 2018 MTC season, and uh, Jeff Augenstein's uh, New Englanders, which was just last October, uh, both at the same stage at MTC. Uh, so if you're tuning in, those are the productions we're talking about. This is also Sahim Ali here, director extraordinaire. Uh, and we're talking about his journey uh, and some of his productions. So in those two productions, I came into those much later on as the composer. You had already sat with those plays for a long time and, and, and seen a bit of their development. Um, what was it that drew you to those stories? Let's start with Sugar in Our Wounds, since that was the first. Uh, and I know that you and, and Danye have a long uh, collaboration as well. So what, what was initially the thing that drew you to that story? The things that draw me to a script um, is two things. One, is it something that I feel like I haven't seen on stage before? Is it trying to do something that is outside of the realm of storytelling as I have um, experienced on stage, you know? And um, the second thing is, has it, is it something that I haven't engaged with myself personally? Because I'm not interested in telling a story if I've already told it or in a way that I feel like I've already told it. So that difference, that um, outside of the realm of something either that I've seen or that I've worked on before, um, those things are really important to me. I'm also always looking for um, a, a play or a story or a musical that is trying to do something that feels a little impossible, that feels a little out of the ordinary. Like what is there that the playwright is hinting at, um, is imagining that doesn't feel like something that is quite achievable. Um, in Sugar in Our Wounds, it was two things. First of all, emotionally, I, don't, I hadn't read a script where someone had connected the experience of slavery with the experience of same-sex love. You know, those were two realms that I've seen very separately, but never had the two collided before. So the fact that Donye was taking something that we know about in terms, yes, like I'm also says like a giant tree on stage. <laughs> I was waiting you know? to say it, but I was, I was trying to, yeah. I was trying to wait. And it's like the, the, the thing about that tree that was so complex was that it had to be real, like they had to climb it, you had to see it, it had to be a tangible thing, but it also needed to be emotional and spiritual. It needed to sing, it needed to move, it needed to, you know, feel alive. And so I read that in the script and I thought, oh my goodness, like, 
how the fuck do we do this? You know? And you know, that how the fuck thing is like really intrigues me if it's called for in a way that feels rooted in the story, rooted in um, something that the writer is trying to grapple with. And then of course you have designers like Arnolfo who then, you know, is one of those collaborators we were talking about that I work with all the time. And then we both sit down and the question becomes how, you know? And we know that we're asking how because the playwright has made it very clear that this needs to happen. You know, mm -hmm. we're not asking why, we're mm -hmm. asking how. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for, for Sugar Now Rune specifically, those were the, some of the characteristics that drew me in. Wow. And then how about New Englanders? Very different story, but also reaching for something that is, um, that I, I hadn't necessarily seen that take on it before. I hadn't seen that exact situation before. So to speak to, you know, your point of what, what drew draws you into a story. Yeah, Jeff's play imagined a uh, same-sex couple of two different races growing up in, living in New England and raising a daughter, a mixed-race daughter. Again, not a story that I've seen before. And I remember at the first day of rehearsal, just kind of articulating this beautiful kind of arc between Sugar Nar Wounds and New, the New Englanders where, you know, a man literally dies at the end of Sugar Nar Wounds because he's unable to, to, to express his love for someone. Uh, in this country. And then we fast forward to, you know, 2019, where two men, not only two men, but of different sexes, living in the suburbs, and it wasn't about race, it was about, um, you know, uh, parenting, it was about love, it was about uh, continuity. And the challenge there was, you know, Jeff has written a script that's really kind of cinematic, and there's so many different settings. And so it was like, how do we make all these different settings come alive in the same space? You know, Sugar could just be at the tree, but we needed like 20 different locations or something. And, there, and again, with Arnolfo, trying to figure out like, how do we make this happen? So again, it did that thing where it was a story that I hadn't seen and um, was asking for something that felt a little bit impossible. Now, we collaborated on those two. And we did. Like, two very different types of uh, music collaborations, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, well it... I, I think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And I was gonna ask you, what would you say are like the things that were kind of similar but different about those two for you? Well, I agree that Sugar in Our Wounds was an unbelievably exciting challenge. Uh, for those of you that didn't see the show, um, there's an enormous tree in the center of the stage that like Sahim said, not only had to be realistic enough for characters to climb, but at a certain part of the show, it needed to change and move as if it was living. Uh, and then it also is, it was essentially a character in the show because it had multiple voices that would sing and interact with the characters in real time. Um, so that was a huge challenge. And I think in that show, uh, it was a lot more clear what the music needed to be. It wasn't necessarily hard, harder, but it was, it was, or, or easier, I mean, but it was, it was very clear that the, the tree needed to be a character and what it's saying um, was, was in the script. So it played a very specific role dramaturgically, you know, the challenge was just how to get it to sound like nothing we had heard before and, and enter Michael Kilgore who uh, is the amazing vocalist and human being that, uh, that sang the voice of the tree. And then essentially, uh, Michael came over to my studio. We recorded all of uh, the music of him singing all of the different words that the tree speaks and sings. And I would just have him do, you know, 15 different takes of every single line and, and ask him to, you know, do this one more deadpan. Uh, flourish with this one, improvise through this one. And then literally we had sort of a sound bank of Michael Kilgore and all of the lines from the tree. And then I would sort of weave together these tapestries of sounds and create chords out of all the different things that he's saying. And then we sort of handed that off, if memory serves, um, to Palmer Heffern, who I think is here as well, the sound designer, who then sort of placed all the different voices in different speakers around the tree to make it sound like different limbs were speaking and singing. So that was incredible. But I think, you know, to your, to your question or to your point, um, it was very clear what the music needed to do there because dramaturgically it was a character essentially and it was coming from this tree. Um, New Englanders was much more interesting, right? Because as you said, it, there's a lot of different locations and things move very fast and kind of on a dime. Um, and I know that that was a huge challenge for you and uh, Ornolfo Maldonado, who's also here, who's the set designer for both of these shows. Uh, I know that was a big challenge for you guys. And I feel like the music in that show worked a little bit more as a design element. Um, 
it sort of told us where we were uh, and also almost worked in the way that um, it was filmic in, in the way that a film or a TV show is. Sometimes it would just provide atmosphere or underscore for transitions to, to happen. And sometimes that's actually the hardest kind of music to compose in my experience because it has to be in between about 50 emotions. If it's mm -hmm. too much this, mm -hmm. it shades the whole scene. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if it's too much this, it's, it doesn't feel like a choice. Like, it's very difficult. And so we had a lot of conversations about that, didn't we? Yeah, because it needs to be a through line, right? It's like, what is the through line then? You know, and we had one of the characters was obsessed with Lauren Hill. And so that was like a template that we used. We were like, well, she loves Lauren Hill. So what can we use that's like in that kind of a vocabulary to give us a sense of that? Um, that helps kind of thread it through and does it work? And it did. And you're like, well, you, what, you know, so, so then it becomes conversations of like energy in each transition. Like when is it fast? When is it slow? And with um, Lauren Hill, you got, there's the, you have all the energy you need. I was thrilled. Yeah. That was like the best <laughs> phone call I'd ever had. We need you to make music that sounds like Lauren, the educa miseducation of Lauren Hill. <laughs> I was like, AKA like the only thing I, I uh, aspire to as a human being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I guess, you know, the, the, the next question that I would have in all of this is now that we're sort of talking about music more specifically, I mean, you originally came into theater through a musical, um, Grease, for those of you that are just joining us. Um, so, but, but then you went on this journey of directing predominantly plays for the last several years, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so all the productions that you've had in New York City have been plays. Um, where do musicals live for you now? Um, would, you know, you, I know you have such a giant passion for music, um, but it's a very different thing working on a musical than a play, even if the play has a lot of music. So what's that all about for you? Where, where are you at with musicals? Yeah, so I, I think it's because my, I didn't have like, you know, cast albums that I would listen to. I mean, Grease was kind of it in terms of like an album that I had. So I didn't necessarily have like, a, you know, uh, even in undergrad, like musicals were not like a big thing because, you know, where you come from and what you're exposed to really does influence like, you know, where you where you where you veer, I think. So it wasn't actually until the end of grad school when we were doing this class. Anne Bogart is the professor at uh, Columbia and we had this class Shout called Imperials class. Shout out Anne Bogart. Um, and we were kind of like excavating and digging in. And that's when I was like, oh my God, Greece. Like it kind of started with Greece. And I was like, I want to do a musical for my thesis. So I did Michael John Acusa's The Wild Party for my musical, uh, for my thesis at Columbia. Where, and I really love that musical. And the characteristics of it are things that I like deeply love about, you know, I, it's, it's dark, it's sexy, it's, it's, you know, there's like violence. Like I tend to like be attracted to kind of darker qualities, especially like with musicals. Um, something like tinged with tragedy. And so mu for the most part, musicals aren't that, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot less of that um, uh, just in general. Um, and so because of my attraction to like slightly darker material, I think I did veer more towards plays. Um, and then it wasn't until, you know, you and I started working on a musical together that I, that is kind of dark too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> We like it. We have our musical goddess. That what do you, what do you think that is that you know? Because I, I think I feel like we're both pretty optimistic people. I feel like most people that know us would consider us, you know, like on the spectrum, fairly happy people. But we love this really dark stuff. What do you think? <laughs> it's you so know, strange, right? It is. It is strange. I know a I lot think, of people like that. Yeah, there are lots of other avenues that have like. I don't know, in my life, like when, like when I go dancing, like I want happy music, you know, I don't want like dark music, but like, there's just some, I think that when you have like pathos on stage, when you have like some sense of loss or some sense of, um, you know, tragedy, it just reminds you of your humanity. It just reminds mm. you of like the fact that you're alive right now and you could lose that life. Maybe it's that, maybe it's like mm. just the elements of danger and tragedy um, and not, I, I, there always has to be hope. For me, it's like, I want those elements, but I do want something at the end that kind of lifts me up. So you have like a lift, but you have like, you touch, you touch the darkness a little bit because it exists in all of us, right? And it is in our worlds. Um, so I feel like there's such truth to that, that when I see a musical that does that, it like just, it, it grabs me in a way because it, the honesty of that just like makes me feel like I'm watching something that's realistic. And if it's a musical that like leans too sunny or leans too happy, 
it just kind of loses me because that's not life. Mm. Um, mm. You know, or doesn't remind me of my humanity. If I'm just like happy and laughing and I walk out happy and laughing, it's like, well, why, why, I can get that like watching, you know, uh, a comedy on TV. It's like, I don't go to the theater for that, you know? Wow, wow. Go for wow. lightness. What, so yeah, Amber says it's more honest, which is Honestly, essentially exactly yeah. what you're saying. Yes, yeah, yes, and I, yes. I agree with that. So, okay, so this, we're, we're going to get to questions and answers at the end, everyone, by the way. We've only got about 20 minutes before Instagram will kick us off. So we're going to get to some questions and answers very soon. So if you got them, be ready. But this, this just like begs me to ask the question. You know, you said musicals don't normally, you know, it's, it's changing rapidly, but historically musicals haven't always been the best vehicle for something dark or for something a little more honest, right? A little more real. They're, they're song and dancey. They have such a reputation mm -hmm. uh, for being sort of superficial for lack of a better word. What do you, now that that is changing, there's people like you and I that are interested in other things. There's amazing composers out there. Strange Loop just won a Pulitzer. Amazing stuff no, right, is happening, right? right? I swear to God, so, I'm so happy with that news. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so, um, wh what do you think the the, the steps forward are? Like, l let me ask you more specifically, because that's such a big question. For you, what would be an exciting musical theater landscape in, let's say, five years? Assuming, of course, that we can all do musicals again, that we can be in the same room. Let's yeah, say that right? as a given. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, well, we're just in this, like, you can't avoid just like the ex existential moment we're in where I think theater will come back. It's just a question of when, right? And so I want to, I, there are all these forms right now that allow us to engage in some way in storytelling. For me, the piece that like just makes my heart sing the most is when I'm in a space breathing the same air, not afraid to touch, seeing people touch and not worried about their health or their well-being, you know, and I want that and I'm, and I'm waiting for that. So the question is how are we going to bridge this distance in this time that we're in before that comes back? I think just like the, the dream and hope of that coming back is something that I want to look forward to. Um, because I'm an optimistic person and I, I, I want to look forward to the future with, um, with, in a positive outlook. So I don't know what the current moment um, means in terms of like what's possible with theater, but the landscape that I want is a landscape that comes back that allows us to just be able to do that without fear of hurting each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Um, on that note, uh, I want to know if there's any questions uh, for Sahim. Um, we, or we for have you? Yeah, or for me, for anybody, uh, look at that, look at that smile, look at, <laughs> look at those twinkly eyes. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, hit us up. Um, I have one more question that I'd like to kick off uh, because we have a lot of, you know, theater, fellow theater nerds in the house, uh, a super craft oriented question. Um, so on one hand, we want musicals that are honest, very believable, um, cover the gamut of emotions, are not cookie cutter, are not fluff. On the other hand, they're musicals. So people open their mouth and sing instead of speaking, which is not realistic. That's, that's not what people do in real life in dialogue. So how do you wrestle these two things? This is something I think about all the time. Yeah. What's that about for you? How do you find that balance? Because I think we both agree that musicals do something that's unbelievable, that, that yeah. elevates a story to a place that words can't go. But yeah. how do you keep it realistic and gritty? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that is the challenge. And I think when you find it, you hit the sweet spot. Yeah. And um, it's, that's the beauty about theater in general, but I think especially with musicals, like look, theater is, 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 is challenging enough to like write a play that's going to hit people, but it's even harder when it's a musical because you, you have story, you have words, but then you have music, you have lyrics that, you, you have dance, like the element, and the more, the more elements you have to wrangle, the fucking harder it is in general. So the fact that a musical works is a miracle, you know? So. And they I, usually don't. They, they cause, usually cause don't. I, I would say nine times out of 10, they don't, you know? So I yeah. think, I think that's always the aspiration. And, uh, and as long as you are, you know, you and I would have that at the top, at the front of our brains. And so I think we would always be, you know, in all our collaborations, um, cause we've had, we've, you know, we have musicals in the works that we're always thinking about. And I would say that they each have that kind of element about them. So, um, I think it's just, 
it you you find the sweet spot when you when you when you have like that thing at the forefront of your brain that you're looking for i see i see yeah and maybe yeah it, it, i also hear you kind of saying like maybe there's something in just attempting the feat because it is such a mount everest like just attempting it like does something it kicks something yeah. up yeah the attempt and then your priorities with the attempt like what are you putting front and foremost you know um i my priorities with almost everything that I do is like, I need, a, I need a person of color in the middle of that story. I have mm -hmm. to say everything that I do, I want that at the center of the story, like unequivocally, you know? And so that becomes a priority that then like just informs everything. So I feel like, and we can have different priorities and we can have different ideas of like what's most crucial to put at the center of a story, but then that already informs things. So I feel like with a musical, if you say, I want this musical to reflect life in a certain way, but I also want it to, um, you know, make my heart sing. And I also want it to um, engage my humanity. It's like, once you set those priorities down and they are at the forefront of what you're trying to do, you'll have no choice but to engage with them, you know? So I think, again, it's that articulation thing. Yes. You articulate what's important to yes. yourself first and then you put it out into the world, then it just informs, it has no choice but to inform the thing. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. Okay, we just got a whole little flood of questions here. So let's go uh, back. Uh, hey, John, so are, who's that question to? He asks, uh, would you ever write a straight play or have you already written one? Um, once you tell us who that's for, we will happily answer it. Uh, the next one is, Sahim, what would you say to children and parents in non-Western countries who want to pursue a career in the arts. Times are better now, but it is still a struggle. What is your message to youth? Hey, Shiro. It's good to see you out there. Ah, yeah, it's a tough one because I, I so understand the, the perspective of, say, my parents, you know? Um, oh, shit. What did I do? Did I do something? Did you lose me? Uh, you went dark, but I think I can still hear your voice. What did I do? Oh, you're... <laughs> Your camera flipped oh, around. I flipped I the camera. How do you flip yeah. it? Is that how you flip it? There you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I understand. I, I understood my parents. I understood that they were so concerned about me because here I am from a third world country coming to America, paying a lot of money to go to school. And how am I going to be able to survive as an artist? But, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think if you're, you have to like, and, and that's true for someone, if you're coming from somewhere else, in the world if you're American here, if, you, if you're passionate enough and if you put your foot to the pedal and you let your passion lead the way, but you also think, you know, just smartly, then, you know, the sky's the limit. But I think it's, it's tough, especially for parents who want the best for their child to reconcile those things. Um, I think Jonathan asked the question about uh, the, the writing, yeah? Yes, Jonathan yeah. asked you, he said, would you write a straight play uh, or are you only interested in writing musicals? Um, so writing, I, I tried my hand at writing and I hated it. I hated it. I hated it not only because I hated what I was writing, but I hated the process of it. I'm just, I'm not a solitary creature. My creativity does not lie in my brain by itself. I need other people. I need collaboration. And so I just hated being by myself and I <laughs> didn't feel like I was doing, uh, you know, that I was writing good material. So even with the musicals that I'm working on, like, you know, Goddess, for example, like Michael is doing the music and Jocelyn is doing the, uh, the book, but like, and so I'm helping shape, but I'm not sitting there like writing dialogue or, or lyrics because I'm just, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of Goddess, uh, Roderick asked, Sahim, I had no idea you were similar to Omari. I'm so curious. Omari is the lead character in our musical Goddess uh, who comes back to Mombasa uh, after being away, getting his master's degree in America. And Roderick says, I'm so curious. What was your experience when you finally told your family that you want to do theater instead of computer science? It's a great question. Well, I, so I, I told my parents, so I went to a five-year college, uh, Northeastern in Boston, and um, I switched my major and I didn't tell them. And I told my parents six months before graduation that, guess what? I actually studied theater and um, that's what I'm going to graduate in. And they were obviously very upset. Um, my mother didn't wow. come to my graduation. So wow. I suffered that. My father did come. 
Um, but, uh, you know, they were, uh, and, and my mother for, for very, uh, you know, for um, concern reasons, but also I was raised strict Muslim. And so, uh, you know, being in the theater is not a very Islamic thing to do. Uh, so th they came around eventually. Um, we're kind of don't ask, don't tell right now. So I don't really talk about the theater stuff because, you know, it just ruffles feathers. But I, I just had to come to a point where I had to choose my priorities. Like, am I going to do something because that's what my parents want me to do? Or am I going to do it because... <laughs> <laughs> but Roger. I didn't... The, the thing that's different where, where I'm not Omari is like, I didn't have like a life, like, you know, plotted out for me. I didn't have like, you know, shoes to step into. They want... It's like anything but theater, you know. If I was a teller in a bank, they would be happy with that. Because then, you know, it'd be like, my son is working in a bank. It doesn't matter what I'm doing there. So it really was about just like the practicality of it and not necessarily like you are destined to walk in like your family's legacy. It wasn't about legacy. It was about practicality. Wow. 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 I got to say, that's just, I mean, this isn't a question at all, but I just have to say publicly, that's insanely brave and insanely strong that you, I mean, you just, you decided that's what you wanted to do. You did it. I mean, folks like me that are from this country and especially a white dude like me, it's like, I didn't have to, to deal with that. Um, you know, and for you to be on the other side of the world and say like, this is what I want to do and go against literally all odds and take the blows, take the fallouts, but do what you thought was right uh, is a huge mark of character. So that's really inspiring to me. I hope it is to everybody watching too. Um, Amber, uh, another one of our favorite people in the world says, what are the biggest challenges, obstacles you face as director composer and how do you navigate those? You go first. Uh, oh man. I mean, writing music and writing songs is just so hard. Um, I, since it's sort of like a general question and, and because we don't have a lot of time, um, I would say that I just show up every day. That's how I navigate it. I just, I try every single day and um, I feel like that's the only way that, uh, you know, one out of a hundred times I can write uh, a, an okay song, uh, it's some okay lyrics and okay melody. Um, and so I just, I just really try every day. I'm one of those work hard people. I wasn't, I wasn't born particularly talented. I just work really hard. <laughs> what about uh, that you? That is not true. That is not true. <laughs> Equal parts, both. Equal parts, both. <laughs> I don't know. What yeah. about you? What about you? I think, um, I think it's the, it's like, we don't make enough in our profession. You know, we don't. We don't get paid enough to do what we do um, in the theater as artists. And um, I constantly think about that. But I also think about that, about the people who I'm collaborating with, like actors, man, like actors, um, you know, constantly going from gig to gig, um, bringing like 180% to each room and um, for so little, you know, and it's, uh, it's a structure that we have fallen into, you know, um, and so I constantly think about how we can make it better, how we can um, just improve the the structure around artists and how to pay artists and how to how to value what we do like you know we're all I can speak I think I can speak for a lot of us in the theater when we say that we are always like you know we're trying to climb that ladder we're trying to then hoping that the next gig will lead to the next gig and it'll be just a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and there'll be more compensation you know because we have to live you know and the the hustle is real the juggle is real and I'm constantly just thinking about how to not only um, um, engage with that, but how then I can just make the room that I'm responsible for as positive and as, um, you know, um, uh, grateful as possible for the people who are engaging with it with us. Because, uh, you know, I don't have control over much. I don't have control of the paychecks as the director of the project, but I do have a control over the, the room that we're in and the space that we're in and the energy that we create. And so expressing it, um, you know, uh, I want to be seen and heard and other artists that I'm with want to be seen and heard too. So I feel like that's just something that, that if there's something that keeps me up at night, it's like, how can we just do this a little bit better? How can we um, um, give the comforts of life to people who are giving their heart and soul to this thing like every single day? Amen. Amen. 
I mean, it's people like you that are uh, already starting to figure it out, though, because, you know, you're you're spending so much time in this quarantine as some of us are, you know, like myself are squirreled away uh, making things. Um, you're, you're out there on these boards and in, in the belly of so many of these really important conversations, uh, which is something that I know I'm deeply thankful for. I know we all are. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, shout out to, we have a lot of actors uh, who are, we both love so much that are on this conversation right now. And anybody else that's watching, I mean, you guys are the lifeblood of the theater. Seriously, you guys are yeah, the ones yeah. that really make this happen. And like what Amber says, we deserve to be seen and heard without such a financial sacrifice and burden. Amen. You know, yeah, it amen. is a financial, it is a, it is a burden. It is a sacrifice, you know, and. And we, dignity, we do, just a little bit of dignity. It's, yeah. it's really hard. The effect that it has on your self-esteem, the effect that it has on your self-worth. Those are really, really real things. It's brutal. Yeah. 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 Um, does anybody else have anything out there? We've got a couple minutes. Um, if anybody else has any questions, shoot them out. You guys are being really sweet in the comments. I love all you guys. This has just turned into like a full blown hang in here. Yeah, this is beautiful. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm like, let's hang up and let's start the, the hour well, over. Everybody just hangs out in here. Michael, let me popcorn. ask you. Let me ask you. As a musician who didn't come from the theater, what is it about the theater that you love? What is it that keeps bringing you back to the theater out of all the forms of music that you could work on? It's 100% the people. 100%. It's, it, there's nobody that's more passionate um, than theater folks. There's nobody that's more ready to just go in 100, like whole hog, just go in and, and really do whatever it, it takes to make something great. Um, and, there's, and there's nobody that's as fearless. I mean, I, I've um, been on stage in theater shows. As you know, I've acted in one of your productions before. I mean, I've been behind the scenes. Not only a production, Shakespeare. You <laughs> wrote music for a Shakespeare play and you acted in a Shakespeare play. That is like, I did. That well, was, I blame the director. Your equity card. <laughs> I, I, I blame the director. I blame the director. But I mean, that is some scary stuff. It's like, it is, th theater is scary in a way that nothing else is because it's so, so vulnerable and it's so raw. And also just the amount of craft that it takes to show up and recreate something and make it feel new every single night. There's not any other form. And this is coming from somebody who's very multidisciplinary, you know, and plays a lot of just concerts that are outside of the theater world. That's very hard in its own way, but it's, it's not like theater. So I think, you know, to, to echo your point earlier, it's something about the Mount Everest of theater. It's something about the all encompassing nature of it. Everything and everybody is there in the mix just throwing it down, you know, and, and, and all bets are off. And I just love that. It's so exciting and, and it's addicting. So I really hope and, we can all, you know. Yeah. And what do you feel that music specifically can do in theater that it doesn't do as well in the other forms that you're in? Well, music is abstract. It's the most, uh, I would argue that it's perhaps the most abstract artistic medium um, out of all of them, which is its strength, um, but also um, can be difficult sometimes as a musician because, you know, I, I've written pieces for orchestra, for instance, and that's amazing mm -hmm. because it's, it's very universal. Anybody can listen to that and be moved. There's no cultural barriers, which is why music is so powerful, but it's, it's also why it's not specific. And so sometimes I yearn for the narrative. Uh, I yearn for words, which is why I like to write lyrics is because the music can uplift meaning and, and give uh, direction to a story uh, in a way that I think some stories need and, in a, and, and, and that story provides something that music can't do on its own. Um, so we are, we're now in our last minute and 40 seconds. We have the little countdown coming down. Ah, so, okay. um, Someone asked how we met, you wanna say? How did we meet? How did we meet? I don't even remember. It was so, it was so long Batiste. ago. Jonathan Batiste. Oh, John Batiste. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of my oldest best friends from Juilliard, John Batiste. Uh, introduced uh sahim and i and we also had a mutual friend in uh terrell mccraney as well so yeah there was a few people and then once we met that was it <laughs> sahim couldn't get rid of me <laughs> roderick so wrong what is so wrong oh my god <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I love him. I love everybody. I love everybody. I mean, I think that that's, that's where this ends is I love everybody. Everybody in this room is amazing. Yes. <laughs> Saeem is amazing. <laughs> it's all amazing. <laughs>
Thank you I for having hope, me, uh, my friends. Yeah, I man, I love you too. You're, you're an amazing guy. I'm so glad we could talk. And I hope everybody that's out there, I hope we can all be in the same room and tell stories together again soon. I, I know we'll be able to. None of us know when or how long, but I know we'll be able to. And to echo Sahim's point, I hope that we all come back with new solutions and new ideas to come back to something that's better than what we left. Not yeah. knocking what was there before, but let's take it to the let's next level. Let's make it even let's better fix, than it was. Yes, Let's please. fix a lot of the yes, issues please. that were there. Amen. So Amen. Let's think about it. Okay. Yeah. I love everybody. Okay. Thank you love so you much, guys. MTC, for Bye. giving us space. Bye-bye. Now I have to figure out how to turn this thing off. Okay, here we go. Bye. <laughs>